So these are the things that we will try to discuss today. And before going into this, we will have a short introduction because we will be using a few terms without really explaining this. We haven't really explained these things before, but I want to uh, keep these things really clear. So, Right. So the first thing is the first one of the terms that we'll be using very often is system. System is a collection of objects, particles, fields, waves, or whatever the, the, the collection of objects that you want to study. It could be particles, it could be fields, anything. And then another thing that we'll be use, uh, using is state space. It's a collection of all states, all physical states occupied the system. Well, that's what we call a space of states or state space. Okay. So, it is actually a mathematical set, you might be familiar with the word set. Right? So, the state space is a mathematical set and what are the elements of the set? The elements of the set are all the possible states of the system. Right? And uh, another term that we will be using is a dynamical system. It is a system that evolves with time, it is a system that changes with time. And we will have a dynamical law, right? once the system, uh, once we are considering systems that change with time. We will be interested to know the future of the system given the percent or the past of the system given the percent or generally given the state of the system at any time, we would like to know the, uh, the, the state of the system at any other time and there is an equation that is uh, obeyed by this system or the state that is known as the dynamical law. It is the equation of evolution. Okay? Uh, for example, it is Newton's equation f is equal to m d square x by d t square. That is a differential equation. You can solve it and you can get x of t and uh, v of t or p of t uh, depending on the way you write it. And finally, we will discuss what we mean by state. Right? So, state by state generally what we mean is everything that you need to know with perfect accuracy to predict the future given the dynamical law. Right? Suppose you know the the dynamical law to be Newton's equation. What information do you need in order to predict the future of the system or find the state of the system at any other time? This is known as the state of the system. Okay. So, we, I, I, I take effort to really cl clearly define these things because these words have slightly different meanings okay, in quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. At least the meanings that we get in our mind are different. We will start with the uh, peak into classical physics. Classical physics is a set of principles and rules. All right? So, classical physics is a set of principles and rules. It is actually an underlying logic. Okay, you have to understand this. By classical mechanics, we mean an underlying logic. It is a logical framework that governs all non-quantum phenomena. Okay? All non-quantum phenomena. Right? So, you might wonder why we start quantum mechanics before going to classical physics. Right? The reason, uh, one of the reasons is that uh, quantum mechanics is actually more fundamental. Right? Quantum physics is more fundamental. Nature is fundamentally quantum mechanical and the classical world can be seen as an approximation, at least we believe it is an approximation of the uh, quantum mechanical laws. The classical laws of motion, the classical equations, the classical physics can be seen as an approximation. All right? When the masses involved are really high, then we need only classical physics, but really fundamental theory the really fundamental thing is uh, quantum mechanics. All right? So, you have to remember that it is an underlying logic. I want to emphasize this point because quantum physics, all right? quantum physics is actually, it is also a set of principles and rules. All right? Quantum physics is also a set of principles and rules. Okay? It is also an underlying logic. I will just write it here. Quantum mechanics is also okay, an underlying logic underlying logic. It is a different kind of framework. All right? You can study the quantum mechanics, the quantum physics of particles, you can study the quantum physics of fields or whatever system that you are worried about. But the rules, the, the rules of logic, right, the underlying logic that we use will be different. All right? So, classical mechanics is a kind of uh, underlying logic all right? and quantum mechanics is a different kind of underlying logic. So, when we go into class from classical mechanics to uh, quantum physics or quant classical physics to quantum physics, you should make this transition in your mind. Right? We are using an entirely different kind of logic right? and we are going to familiarize ourselves with the 
with this particular logic and fundamental to this quantum mechanical way of thinking is the principle of superposition okay fundamental to the quantum mechanical way of thinking is the principle of superposition we'll be discussing what we mean by these things okay principle of superposition now classical physics includes newton's equation it includes uh, maxwell's faraday theory of electromagnetic fields special and general theory of relativity these are all, these are all built inside this particular underlying logic okay and a simple example is the newton's equation okay. so in order to solve this you need for example if you write it as f is equal to m d square x by dt square right? this is a second order differential equation once you know the force you can integrate it but you have to integrate it twice so you'll have two integration constants so you need two uh, things in order to completely solve this equation all right once you solve this equation you'll get x of t and p of t but there are two constants of integration and this constant of integration is we usually say we call it as the initial position and the initial momentum so once you have the initial position and the initial momentum and you know the forces acting on the system newton's equation will tell you exactly what the future is or where the system is going to where the system is evolving right so this is what we call the state right state is a set of position and momentum right we can say that state is uh, the the definition of state at least in the newtonian framework is the position and momentum if you know the position and momentum at any time you can know the position and momentum at any other time using newton's equation in other words if you know the state of the system uh, at any time you can know the state of the system at any future time by solving newton's equation okay i hope that's clear this is what we mean by state so uh, specifying the state completely in newtonian physics means giving the position and momentum of all the particles involved right you, if you need a, if you are talking about a composite system specifying the state completely means generally means you have to specify the position and momentum of all the particles in this system okay now once we write the state as x comma p right this uh, i have written it generally it, if it's a single particle in one dimension you will have just one position one dimension one x and p right if the okay so that's the state now here the state space is known as the phase space the state space of uh, classical physics or newtonian equation is known as the phase space what was uh, what was state space state space state space was the set of all possible states of the system and by state you mean position and momentum okay so if you uh, if you uh, take a set of all position and momentum it's known as the phase space all right you might be familiar with this term phase space okay so if you take a single particle in three dimension okay in order to specify its position and momentum completely we talk about a phase space it has nothing to do with any real space it's an abstract space but what are the points in this space labeled by the points in this space are labeled by position and momentum so if you take a single particle in three dimensions you will need three coordinates to completely specify the position you will need three numbers to completely specify the momentum right so altogether the phase space would be six dimension okay so here phase space is the state space of a classical mechanical system i hope that's clear now we are ready to move on to quantum mechanics so you have to understand that quantum mechanics arose out of observations which showed subtle discrepancies between actual behavior of the world and descriptions of uh, classical physics so the thing is people started doing experiments people thought that physics is complete with classical mechanics all right we just have to use the underlying logic of classical mechanics to different problems if you are talking about subatomic particles just use the underlying logic and uh, see how things work Right. but once they started applying the laws of classical mechanics or this fundamental logic to subatomic particles like electrons okay or protons or generally atoms subatomic particles okay. in the subatomic world the rules of classical mechanics gave different predictions from what was actually observed okay so there were observations which were not consistent with classical mechanics this is the reason why we have quantum mechanics right so quantum mechanics is a mathematical framework it's a mathematical framework which was built okay mathematical framework built to describe observations okay otherwise no one would have thought of, uh, of any theory like this so we were quantum mechanics was forced upon us by all these experimental observations 
okay, or experimental results. So there were so many observations, so much data was accumulated, which could not make sense in the classical mechanics framework. Right? And people started uh, trying to construct theories and there were two successful theories in the beginning. One is known as matrix mechanics due to Heisenberg. Okay, matrix mechanics was due to Heisenberg and there was wave mechanics due to Schrodinger. Right? So initially they looked entirely different. The way Heisenberg wrote his equations looked entirely different from the way Schrodinger wrote his equations. Okay? And it was Dirac who actually showed, uh, who, who actually gave a unified framework. He showed that this, these, are the, these are actually two different representations of the same underlying theory. Okay. So Dirac understood matrix mechanics and wave mechanics as two representations of uh, the same underlying theory. And it's that underlying theory that we are going to study first, right? because that's logically more beautiful. We can study this underlying theory of which matrix mechanics and wave mechanics are uh, representations. Okay. That's what we'll be doing first. So the way I explain things, so this was just an introduction to quantum mechanics and the way I explain things are not historical, right? This is not the way in which quantum mechanics was developed historically. It's not historical. Although if you need a really good understanding of quantum mechanics, if you are interested in it, it's a good thing to go to the history of it, right? How certain ideas came and how people argued, how Einstein came up with objections. These are all really interesting stories, but it will take a lot of time. So. Our approach would be semi-logical, right? Semi-logical. So we'll, uh, I'll try to motivate the mathematical framework of quantum mechanics by looking at a thought experiment. Okay, that's what we'll do. Thought experiment. So we'll uh, we'll talk about a thought experiment that tells us how electrons behave actually in nature, right? Or how electron behaves in experiments, and then we'll. Uh, pretend that we are constructing a mathematical framework that describes this kind of behavior. Okay? And the, the thought experiment that I just mentioned is known as the double slit experiment. It's known as the uh, double slit experiment. We'll shortly call it as DSC. Okay? Now there were so many uh, surprising experimental observations and we'll summarize it just by this uh, thought experiment called double slit experiment. All right? And in the double slit experiment, we will observe how the electron behaves in experiments. Okay? And we will see how the electron behaves. We don't know why the electron behaves like that. But once we know how the electron behaves, we will try to construct a mathematical framework. Okay? And one more thing, uh, which we won't come back to until later in this series. Okay? So there are different interpretations of uh, the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a well developed, it is well developed. Okay, and well tested mathematical framework. Okay, mathematical framework or mathematical theory. All right, it's a well developed and well tested mathematical theory, but nobody knows what it actually says about nature. Okay, we can make predictions and these predictions are correct, but what does it actually say about the electron? This is not really clear. We don't have this problem of interpretation in classical mechanics. It's very clear what this uh, equation, Newton's equation, means, for example. Okay, and there are different interpretations. You have to be aware of this. Okay, and uh, I will be. In, in the, for the purpose of this talk, I will be using a particular interpretation. So when I talk about these things, I will be in my mind, I will be assuming a particular interpretation. Okay, I will be assuming a particular interpretation, but you don't have to worry about it. Once we go to the mathematics in the end, in one of the future uh, lectures, we'll discuss all these interpretations. All right, we'll, we can even examine this interpretation if you want. This interpretation I will call as the literal interpretation. Okay, this is just a term, literal interpretation, which means that I am Assuming that, I am assuming that quantum mechanics, the mathematics of quantum mechanics, literally describes the behavior of nature. Okay, so there is no different interpretation. We will take the mathematics literally. Right, that's the thing that we will be doing. Now we are ready to go into the double slit experiment. It's a very interesting experiment. The experimental setup is rather simple. You have got an arrangement with slit two slits. We'll call this as S two and this as S one. We have got two slits. Okay. And we, we also need a screen. We also need a screen. This is the screen. The screen and this double slits all must be chosen appropriately. But we won't worry about the experimental details here because it's a thought experiment. 
Okay. So don't worry about the experimental details. So first we'll do the double set experiment using a machine gun. Right. So if you if you if you just uh, shoot a bullet at the wall, you know that it will make a hole on the wall. Right. Now you are between the wall and your machine gun, you are keeping a double slit arrangement. Now you are sending bullets through the double slit arrangement and each bullet will make a hole on the wall. Right? And as time goes on, if you do it sufficient number of times, if you shoot sufficient number of times, you will see a pattern like this. Right? So behind slit 1, there will be all the bullets which passed through slit. So behind, um, behind slit 2, you will have all the bullets which passed through slit 2 and behind slit 1, you will have all the bullets which passed through slit 1. Okay? So sorry, Before, behind slit 1, you will have all the bullets that passed through slit 1. Okay? So bullets passing through here will reach here and bullets passing through here will reach here. Nothing surprising. Okay? This is the pattern that you expect. Okay? This is all fine, but now we are going to do this double slit experiment using electrons. Okay, the next thing we are going to do is the double slit experiment using electrons. Okay. All right. First, I need to clarify. We don't know what electrons are. They are really microscopic. We haven't seen electrons. Okay, so we don't know what electrons are. Okay? So we are trying to understand what electrons are based on their behavior. Okay? So first, we'll send an electron to the screen. Okay, this is the screen, cross-section of this. So, you just send one electron to the screen. So, the screen we choose appropriately. Okay, I won't go into the details of what kind of screen we are using. We have a screen such that when an electron falls on it, it makes a spot. Okay, every electron falling makes a, creates a spot on the screen. Okay, so electron behaves just like a particle. You see a particle which hits the screen makes a spot on it. Just like a bullet hits the wall and makes a hole on it. Right. So, electron hits a, uh, creates a spot on the screen. We choose the screen in that way. Okay. This is exaggerated. Right. And this is a cartoon. Right. What you draw here is a cartoon. It's just for the representation of what's actually happening. Okay. Now, we know this. How electron interacts with the screen? It interacts like a particle. It creates a spot. That's fine. Now, what we do is that we keep the uh, double slit arrangement first with only slit 1 open. Right, we'll keep slit 1 open and send electrons through it. This is an electron beam gun. Okay, which is a very advanced kind of electron gun, uh, which we can manipulate as we wish. So, we are sending electron to this single slit. Okay? And as expected, you see a pattern behind slit 1. Nothing surprising there. Alright, so if you are careful enough, you will see surprising things there. But just for the time being, let's assume this is the kind of pattern that we see. Okay, so we are making some approximations here. Don't worry about this for the effect of, for dramatic effects, all right. And there are other uh, uh, problems in this pattern itself, which uh, are not really visible immediately, all right. So, at first sight, this is the kind of pattern that we get behind screen 1 and this is the kind of pattern you get behind screen 2. And we explain it very easily because the electrons passing through slit 1 will pass, will uh, make spots on here and the spots will build up to this pattern eventually. This is what we expect. Okay. Now, we continue the experiment with both slits open. Right? And what we expect is this just like the machine gun thing. Right? Because we expect that the electrons, electrons seem like particles because they make spots on the screen, just single spots on the screen. Okay? So, we expect that the electron passing through this slit will make a pattern like this and the electron passing through this slit make a pattern there. This is what we expect, just like a machine gun. But what actually happens is a bit surprising. This is the kind of thing we get. Okay, this is the kind of thing that we actually get, not this, for, not for electrons, okay, not this for electrons, but we get this. And this pattern resembles an interference pattern, you might be familiar with uh, the experiments with the light beam, but you don't worry about it, we'll call this as an interference pattern, interference pattern, okay. If you are not familiar with interference, don't worry, just consider it as a name for this kind of pattern, as opposed to this. So, you see that there are points where the electrons does not fall, there are points where electrons fall. Okay? Now, you need to explain this interference pattern. Okay? Uh, so, so far we saw a cartoon, let's just, uh, let's just make it a little bit more clear with this probability plot. Okay? So, here instead of the actual picture on the screen, we are right drawing the probability plot, which means that at each point, the height of this curve gives the number of electrons that has fallen here 
on this point of strain divided by the total number of electrons. Okay. The height of this curve at this point represents the number of electrons that has fallen here divided by the total electrons that has been sent to, from the uh, electron gun. Is this clear? I hope this is clear. Okay. And uh, here we call this a slit 2 and this a slit 1. Okay. So, this is the pattern that you will get if only slit 2 is open or only if, if only this slit is open. If this is the only slit that is op open, this is the probability pattern you will get. Nothing surprising. This is what we mean by probability, right? Because it is the fraction. Okay. It is the fraction of all the electrons that uh, reached this point out of the total number of electrons. This is what we call the probability. So, this peak gives you actually the probability that an electron will fall at this point. This, this is the experimental probability, right? This is the experimental probability. Okay? Experimental probability because you, suppose you count all the electrons that has fallen at this point and divide it by the total number of electrons, then you get the experimental probability or the measured probability. Okay? Similarly, this is the probability pattern uh, behind this slit. Okay? But but when both slits are open, you see that you get a different kind of pattern, right? You don't get this, you don't get just a normal sum of these two patterns. No, this is what we expect. This is what we would get for a machine gun, but that's not what we get. We get this kinds of weird probability plot. Okay, I'll call this weird. Okay, it's actually weird. The thing is that, the important thing is that if, for example, you take this point, okay, this is, this point star of zero probability, okay, the, the, the low point of this probability plot, these are points where there are no electrons. Okay? But if you see the same point on the screen with only one slit, you see that there were electrons here. Am I right? Similarly, there were electrons here when slit 1 was open. Okay? Take this point. Okay? When slit 2 are open, that number of electrons that has fallen here is 0. But when slit 1 was open, there were electrons that actually fell at this point. All right. So, the electron seems to behave differently depending on whether you have opened one slit or both slits. I hope this point is clear. Okay. So, the dramatic thing is that the points of zero intensity or the points where there are no electron, for example, this point, okay, no electron when both slits are open. Both slits are open. There are no electrons here when both slits are open. But if you look, if only slit 1 was open, there were some electrons here. Okay. Some electrons reached here. We are talking about the same point in the screen, alright. Uh, when only one slit was open. Okay. I hope this is clear. Now we try to explain this. How do we explain this behavior? And this is what's actually happening. I'll show you uh, an animated image of this. This is what's actually happening. All right. So the electrons come through both slits, and uh, so the electrons coming through both slits. Actually, this is the kind of interference. This is the way the interference pattern is actually built up. Okay. See, you see the spots. All these spots build up, and in the end, you see that you get a nice interference pattern. Okay. That's a picture of it. All right. Now, what's the first explanation that comes to your mind? Okay. You see that there is interference. Electrons interfere. Okay. Let's just say, let's just make a hypothesis. Electrons show interference. Electron interfere. Electrons interfere. But with what? What does the electron interfere with? Okay. Interfere with what? Okay. The first thing that comes to your mind is maybe there are electrons which pass through slit 1. There are electrons which pass through slit 2. Maybe these electrons interfere with each other. Okay, we can think of that hypothesis, all right? Maybe electrons, different electrons, okay? Maybe different electrons passing through S1 and S2 interfere. Okay, this is a possibility. Maybe they interact and somehow uh, the interference pattern appears. But this can be easily tested. All right? This hypothesis can be easily. If the, it would be fine. It would be nice if this was the case. All right? It would be easy to explain if this was the case. But this can be checked easily. All right? What do you do? You send just one electron at a time. Okay, you just send one electron at a time. And only after that electron has hit the screen, 
and made a spot you send the second electron okay and that also hits uh, on the screen and uh, uh, after that you send the third electron so you send electrons one by one one at a time okay but if you do this for sufficiently long time in the end again you see the same pattern you get the same pattern even with single electrons all right so that's what i have said here same pattern is obtained when electrons are sent one at a time the okay, same pattern is obtained when electrons are sent one at a time okay. so the pattern is not caused by interference of different electrons all right okay and now the pattern is so if you look at just one electron reaching the screen you don't see any, inter any interference pattern it's just one spot on the screen okay but this interference pattern is made up of individual spots individual spots this interference pattern is made up of individual spots on the screen right this is how electrons behave we don't know why okay so each electron makes a spot on the screen right and the interesting thing again is here the pattern made of single electrons with one slit open okay is different from pattern made with of electrons with both slits are open okay now how do you explain this how do you explain this okay. now we ask this following question it's usually asked in this way how does the electron know whether a single slit or both slits are open okay that's a million dollar question but this no i have put in quotes because electrons really don't have any consciousness uh, we just uh, say it all right for the effect of it how does the electron actually know whether a single slit is open or both slits are open because if a single slit is open the electron can fall here okay but if both slits are open the electron never reaches here the single electron right that's what's happening and this is just an example right we have got the interference pattern if only slit we block this okay if only slit one is open let's say the electron reaches this point okay and you, you do the same experiment with both slits open and you see that the electron never reaches here okay, that's an example there are points where electrons reach and there are points where electrons do not reach so the, how does the electron know whether uh, both slits are open or is or whether only one slit is open okay now how does the interference pattern form when one electron is sent through the slits at a time right how is the interference pattern formed again the question what does the electron interfere uh, with okay there is an interference pattern so the question is what does the electron interfere with okay now we play around with so many possible answers that we can think of and we come to a conclusion that each electron interferes with itself whatever that means all right we have to conclude that each electron actually interferes with itself okay there's no other way this can happen so each electron uh, interferes with itself all right another possibility to think is that the electron actually splits into two okay uh, and then somehow regions but this is very costly hypothesis all right because if you have for example three slits all right then again you will have an interference pattern and then you will have to imagine that electron is split into three if you have infinite slits okay or near infinite slits you will have to imagine that electron actually is divided into infinite pieces so this is not possible because electrons always appears as a single hole okay in all the experiments electron appears as a single entity and never as a fraction never as a fraction right so we don't have to imagine that electron actually splits or something we just have to assume that each electron interferes with itself how does this happen for this to happen each electron every single electron passes through both slits at the same time okay so this is the conclusion we come by looking at the interference pattern all right in other words we have to conclude that uh, the electron every single electron okay single electron is in slit 1 and slit 2 at the same time and then it interferes with itself okay. now this above proposition okay this is the proposition that worked it's known as the principle of superposition okay superposition is not any kind of position it's another word okay superposition it could be you can do any different experiments all right you can do experiment involving spin in experiment involving polarization and in all these cases you will have to, you will see that the electron actually seems to exist in more than one state at the same time and you may not understand this it's not very intuitively clear but mathematically there's no problem okay See, for example, if you take a coin or something, classical object, when I say that the coin is here, it means that it's not anywhere else. Am I right? 
when I say that a coin is here, it means that it is not anywhere else. Okay. But in the case of electron, you cannot say that. The electron can be in slit 1 and slit 2 at the same time. We are talking about the same electron, not different electrons. The same electron can be at two places at the same time. The same electron can be at different places at the same time. The same electron can be everywhere at the same time. This is allowed in quantum mechanics. And this is the conclusion that is forced upon us by nature. Okay. This is forced upon us. This is forced upon us by nature. Okay, we have no choice here okay. and this is not just about position. If you look at different energy, right, different possible energies of electron, you will see that electron can exist in different energy levels at the same time. A single electron, okay? a single electron can exist in different momentum states at the same time. A single electron can exist in different spin states at the same time. Okay? This is the only way we can make sense of uh, the double slit experiment or all the subatom experiments. So, people tried to avoid this conclusion, but they saw that this is the only consistent way in which we can formulate the theory of subatomic particles. Okay? So, this is what we call as, as, as the principle of superposition. Okay? We will uh, formalize it a little bit. Okay? So, the principle of superposition that we concluded from experiment, all right? this we got from experiment, from the double slit experiment that the electron actually exists in two places at the same time. Okay? The principle of superposition, we can take it as a postulate and we will say that the quantum state of a system is a superposition of all possible states. Okay? The quantum state could be a position state, it could be an energy state, momentum state or polarization. All the experiments point to this fact. The quantum state of a system is in a superposition of all its possible states. So, if there are possible states S1 and S2, it can be, if there are possible states S1 and S2, it can be in a state called S1 plus S2. This is what we mean by superposition, being at two states at the same time. Okay? Now, principle of superposition is fundamental to quantum mechanics. It is purely quantum mechanical. There is no such thing in classical mechanics. Okay? Now, all weirdness of quantum mechanics can be traced back to superposition. Okay? Now, we can write it as an equation if you like. Okay. So, we do not know exactly how to describe a state. So, we will use this uh, notation for a state. Okay. By this notation, this angled bracket, what I mean is that we are talking about the state of the electron. Right? So, the electron inside the angled bracket means the state of the electron. We do not know what objects these are. All right? State of an electron. We just need a notation to describe the state of an electron. Okay. We, don't, we still do not know, we do not yet know how to uh, describe the state mathematically, but for the now, for the time being, we'll uh, choose a notation like this to describe the state of the electron. So this means it's a state of being in slit one. This means it's a state of being in slit two. Okay. So in double slit experiment, we have electrons at two positions at the same time, and other experiments show that this is the case for other measurable quantities like energy, momentum, polarization, spin, etc. Okay. All right. Now, we said that principle of superposition is one thing that is forced upon by nature. So, our mathematical theory, the mathematical framework, mathematical framework, okay, when we construct the mathematical framework, it has to include this fact. Okay? It should take into account of this experimental fact that the electron can exist in different positions at the same time. So, this is one. Uh, requisite for our mathematical framework. Okay, I hope this is clear. We saw that electron can exist in two different positions. So, when we create a mathematical framework, we should have something corresponding to electron being at two positions at the same time or two different states at the same time or a number of different states at the same time. Okay, I will just repeat it. When we, when we construct the mathematical framework, mathematical framework okay it should involve okay something corresponding to we are taking this as a reality okay corresponding to an electron being in different states at the same time. Okay. 
So, this is one of the ingredient, the principle of superposition is one ingredient of a mathematical framework that we have to construct. Okay. Now, I made a grand claim that each electron passes through both slits at the same time. Okay, this is a very grand claim. It is a grand claim. You can test it. Okay, you can actually test it. How do you test? You just put cameras behind slit 1 and slit 2. So, this camera can detect electron passing through this slit and this camera is equipped so that it can detect electrons passing through this slit. Okay, that is simple as that. By camera, we do not mean an actual camera. It is some kind of apparatus which can actually uh, measure the electron. All right? It could be a particle detector which is equipped to see whether the electron has actually passed through slit 1. Okay? So, we said that electron actually passes through slit 1 and slit 2 at the same time. So, we put two cameras here and we see if, if the electron is registered in this camera, we know that it passed through this slit. If the electron is registered in this camera, we know that it passed through this slit. That is the arrangement. Okay. So, what do we expect here? We already said that the electron is in slit 1 and slit 2 at the same time. So, we expect to see the electron registered in this camera as well as this camera. That is what we expect okay. at least because we made a nice hypothesis. Okay. So, our aim is to observe the electron uh, actually at two places, okay. but then the result is interesting. We see electron either in this camera or in this camera. It is never registered in both cameras. All right. So, the result is that each electron is always found in either in slit 1 or in slit 2, never in both slits simultaneously. Okay? Never in both slits simultaneously. Okay? This is the result. Now, this is another problem that we have. It is even problematic, problematic than the principle of superposition. Okay? Never in both slits. All right. Now, this is uh, the thing. So, does this mean that the electron does not pass through both slits at the same time? How we dis do we need to discard our earlier hypothesis that electron actually passes through both slits at the same time? The answer is no, because when you actually keep this camera here and see that electron either passed through slit 1 or through slit 2, you see that there is no interference pattern. No interference pattern. Okay. So, if the electron passes through both slits, you will get an interference pattern. All right. But when you detect the electron, uh, when you try to understand which uh, slit the electron passed through, then there is no interference pattern. The interference pattern is lost. Okay. This is what is happening. So, this is the double slit experiment. Without the camera, you get an interference pattern here without the camera and this is the double slit experiment with the camera. Okay. All right. So, we will again um, make notes here. We have done an experiment. We will make notes and this is the kind of behavior that we have to describe using our mathematical framework. Okay. So, this is what we said. Electron behaves in different ways depending on whether we are looking at it or not. If you are looking at it with the camera, it behaves nicely. If you, are, if you have a camera here, it behaves nicely and it either goes to slit 1 or to slit 2. No problem. Okay. If you are not looking at it, they behave weirdly and go through both slits at the same time, giving you the interference pattern. Okay. So, the, our conclusion is this. Electron has to be in slit 1 and slit 2, uh, every single electron, okay. when there is no camera, because that is the reason, that is how we explain the interference pattern here. Okay. But it is in slit 1 or slit 2 when observed. When you observe, it is either in slit 1 or slit 2. All right. Now, let us make a number of measurements. It is a thought experiment and, and we will say that the probability is 50, 50 okay, or 50 percent that the experiment is set up in such a way or in the given experimental setup, we see the electron 50 percent of the time in slit 1 and 50 percent of the time in slit 2 when we try to understand in which slit it is. All right. So, this is a experimentally measured quantity. Let us just say in our experimental setup, it is 50 percent. All right. So, the mathematical framework of quantum mechanics must describe the above behavior and predict the probabilities and predict the probabilities for measurements. Okay? So, we need different things happening here. It needs to the mathematical framework needs to include superposition. Okay? It should be able to predict the probabilities. Okay? There should be something in the mathematical framework that gives us that allows us to calculate the probabilities. For example, this 50-50. The theory should predict that you should get 50-50. And third thing, 
all right this may not be included in the mathematical framework but it should tell us what happens when you make a measurement okay so when you are looking at the electron it's never in superposition it's always in one of the possible states so the the theory that we are trying to construct should take into account of all these three uh, things okay because this is the way nature behaves we look at nature and our job as physicists is to describe nature the way we see it in experiments okay so we do so many experiments we are describing the experiments using a mathematical theory uh, at, uh, you may start asking why this happens why does the electron behaves like behave like this the answer is i don't know okay i don't know why the electron behaves like this probably nobody knows why the electron behaves like this we just know that this is the way electron behaves okay so we have done the double slit experiment all right so as i said before we need the main ingredient is superposition superposition all right which means that in our mathematical framework we need objects okay we need mathematical objects when we make a mathematical framework we need mathematical objects mathematical objects that behaves like electrons and what's the main behavior of electrons if the electron is in slit 1 and slit 2 okay then it's also in both slits at the same time okay this is the behavior of an electron right if this is a possible state and this is a possible state then this is also a possible state okay now if you are familiar with some mathematics you remember that this sounds like vectors right if you for example if you take three dimensional vectors if you take r1 vector and r2 vector you see that it's another vector in the same space right all right so if you take two vectors and you add you see that it's another vector in the same space right this sounds like uh, an electron why not vectors why don't we use vectors because here if this is a possible state and this is a possible state the superposition is also a possible state here if you have this is a vector this is a vector then the superposition is also a vector okay so this uh, this is uh, similar right why don't we try to describe electrons or why don't we try to represent electrons using vectors because they seem to behave in the same way okay? there's a problem here because uh, if you use three dimensional vectors the three vectors as you call it the three vectors okay which means that it has three components three in the i j k are the basis etc if there are three vectors uh, sorry if, if you are talking about three vectors or so three dimensional vectors there are only three independent vectors, three independent directions, okay? three independent states. Okay? So you can only account for three independent states if you are taking vectors. This sounds like vectors and this is a good guess. Okay, okay this is uh, one state. Okay? So you see that the behavior is very similar. Okay, you see that the behavior is very similar but we cannot choose this because this can have only at, at most it can have only three independent vectors okay but we need to describe electron with the definite position or which is at a point etc and each point is independent of each other and we may have infinite points all right if you take space there are infinite points on it Okay. So, there are, you need a vector space, so you need some kind of vectors with infinite independent vectors, with at, at most infinite independent vectors, because each position is independent, right? And electron can be in different positions at the same time, so you need a kind of mathematical construct similar to vector space, which involves, which allows infinite number of independent vectors, because we need to, th that's the kind of behavior we need to describe. Okay. And then you look at some mathematical mathematics textbook okay you take your afghan right? mathematical physics by afghan and just go through it you'll see that there indeed is a nice mathematical framework like this it's known as linear vector space it's known as linear vector space okay? it is a generalization of the ordinary vector space that i talked about all right it, it can be considered it can be considered i'll call this as lvs all right linear vector space you can take your mathematical textbook or some mathematics textbook and for no reason people have invented this uh, mathematical framework invented or discovered i don't know but uh, in mathematical framework you see that this mathematical framework already exists okay and you can understand it as a generalization of the ordinary vector space that i talked about and there are two generalizations all right there are two directions in which this, in which the generalization comes the first idea is that we allow the scalars to be complex numbers okay? because for example if you take this vector a uh, let's say r vector is equal to xi plus yj plus zk am i right 
okay and we can write it as also the column matrix x y z and what are this these are real numbers these are real numbers okay this scalars the scalar quantities in real vector space are real numbers and this i j k we call as basis right this i j k we call it as a basis set okay this is the basis in terms of which we expand all the vectors so all the vectors in three dimensional space can be expanded in terms of three basis vectors all vectors can be written a a vector is equal let's say a x i plus a y j plus a z k in three dimensions okay and these are real numbers and we call the set i j k as the basis set okay or basis vectors all right and in linear vector space this numbers are no more real it can be complex right we allow this numbers to be complex numbers and we do not restrict ourselves to three dimensions there can be infinite dimensions even okay so this is linear vector space it exists even before uh, quantum mechanics linear vector space already exists uh, in mathematics before quantum mechanics even came to existence okay so we'll try we'll try to make this correspondence a bit more uh, concrete Okay. So I want you to understand there is no logical reason why this is the correct mathematical framework. Okay, so the thing is that we make a mathematical framework, we construct a theory, and see if the predictions are correct, and we make predictions and check if the predictions are correct. All right. The reason why we choose this mathematical framework ultimately is because it works. Okay, that's the only reason. There is no other logical reason here. There is no really logical reason to choose linear vector space. but uh, you just try and you see that it works the correspondence works there's no other logical reason for that okay ultimately the theory that you construct has to describe nature that's all okay. now let's look into vector space okay. a vector space consists of a set of vectors together with a set of scalars which is closed under two operations vector addition and scalar multiplication which means that if you add two vectors you will get a vector in the same space if you multiply it with a scalar you again get a vector in the same space it doesn't take you out of the vector space so by vector space you don't have to uh, think of the three dimensional space no in uh, mathematics space means it's a set of points it's just a set it's just a mathematical sets okay it's a set of objects right it's a set it's just a set you don't have to confuse it with the real three dimensional space okay that's still there it's not gone uh, this is a different kind of abstract space okay it's a mathematical set okay. now the scalar mentioned are ordinary complex numbers and closed what do we mean by closed that it means that if you do this operations it will never carry you out of the space so if you have a set you take two elements in the set and you multiply it by a complex number or add it will again remain inside this set okay that's what we mean by closed and there is a nice uh, symbol okay to represent the vectors this is we put a number or a symbol inside an angled bracket okay this is a notation that will be follow will follow it's known as the dirac notation it's known as the dirac notation okay dirac notation So in Dirac notation we represent the vectors in linear vector space by an angled bracket and inside angled bracket could be a symbol or a number anything okay now you will see that it's not surprising okay it's not a coincidence that we chose to describe the write the state of the electron like this okay electron in slit 1 we wrote it like this here this was the notation for vector okay and there's a reason why we used the same notation which you will see soon Okay. and closure under addition means if you take two vectors add them you get another vector in linear vector space okay you take two vectors and add you get another vector in linear vector space okay so so the property of closure under addition and multiplication by scalars let us construct vectors which are linear combination of other vectors so if you have two vectors alpha and beta okay you can construct a third vector by this rule a alpha plus b b beta is also a vector okay so given two vectors you can construct more vectors like this this is not a superposition all right now you compare so that means if alpha and beta are vectors in linear vector space then so is 
this this also vector linear vector space now compare it with what we said earlier if s1 and s2 are possible states of the electron we said earlier the principle of superposition if s1 and s2 are possible states of electron then a superposition of them is also a possible state of the electron we said this okay and here we are saying if alpha and beta are two vectors then a superposition of them is also a vector all right so these are two different things this we made from experiment this is from the mathematical framework they sound very similar okay so why don't we just make this identification all right so we'll make this identification so we just compare these two statements they look very similar let's just say all right quantum mechanical states can be represented by vectors in linear vector space all right because of the similarity we are just trying this possibility all right we are trying this possibility that quantum mechanical states can actually be represented by vectors in linear vector space okay now the vector space in which the quantum mechanical states live uh, is known as the hilbert space we won't go into the definition of it right now we'll be doing it in future classes if time allows okay you just remember that hilbert space is just a subset of linear vector space right so the linear vector space that describes quantum mechanical systems or quantum mechanical states is known as the hilbert space i want you to remember this as a uh, word i want you to keep this uh, word in your mind okay and the state space of quantum mechanics is called the hilbert space hilbert space involves vectors okay hilbert space involves vectors all right so the state space of classical mechanics was known as a phase space okay the state space of quantum mechanics is called the hilbert space this means that uh, all the possible uh, all the elements in a hilbert space Okay, all the vectors in Hilbert space corresponds to a possible state of a quantum mechanical system. This means that all vectors in Hilbert space is a possible state, represents a possible state of the electron. Okay, this is what we mean when we say that the state space of quantum mechanics is called the Hilbert space. Okay. All right. So to conclude, in mathematical formulation, vectors in linear vector space corresponds to possible states of the quantum mechanical system. The possible states of the quantum mechanical system corresponds to vectors in Hilbert space. This identification lets us incorporate the principle of superposition in a beautiful way. Okay. So the first thing that we wanted to include in our mathematical theory is the principle of superposition and we have achieved it by choosing linear vector space. All right. We have achieved uh, the representation of superposition principle by choosing the mathematical framework of linear vector space okay all right but that's not all we we in in classical physics we do, we have states okay and state is the position and momentum there is nothing surprising here but now we are saying that state is some abstract vector in some abstract space all right abstract vector in abstract abstract space now how do we extract measurable quantities Okay. Suppose I know that the state of the system is represented by a particular vector in the Hilbert space. Okay. So the theory has to answer the following question. Right? If the electron is represented by this state and you measure the energy, what value will you get? Right? If you measure the energy, what value will you get? Okay. So these measurable quantities are known as observables. Okay. Energy, momentum, spin, polarization, all these are examples for observables. Position are all observables all right we have the state all right how do we represent observables all right so we look into linear vector space and you see that there are other objects called as operators okay there are other objects called operators you might you might already be familiar with the word operator okay so mathematically an operator defines a relation between two vectors an operator defines a relation between two vectors all right which means that an operator acting on a state generally changes it into another state all right and in this equation this a cap with the hat a hat is called an operator the vector beta is obtained by acting uh, a cap on vector alpha all right now i'll give you a, uh, i'll give you two examples for this all right for vectors in linear vector space you will have for example column matrices column matrices okay if you look at column matrices you will see that it follows all the axioms of linear vector space so you can say that column matrices form a linear vector space okay also complex functions functions like f of x which are complex let's say f of z okay complex functions 
let's say f of x all right this means not f of z it's sorry i'm sorry it's not f of z it's f of x okay which means that corresponding to each x this function gives you a complex number okay so i'll give you two examples now i'll give you two examples for linear vector space okay the first example is the column matrices you will see that it obeys all the uh, so there are some elements here all right all the properties of a linear vector space another is a complex function like f of x or f of x comma y comma z or f of r vector okay. this means that this complex function spits out a number if you if it spits out a complex number all right if you give a number here for x it could be a position for example and it gives you a complex number of the form a plus ib so associated with every point in space you have a complex number that's an example for a complex function okay? so it's easy to see that complex functions as well as uh, column matrices right column matrices behave uh, or, or they construct vectors in linear vector space all right it follows all the properties of linear vector space Okay, so two examples column matrices and complex functions all right and an example for an operator is even simpler you know that if you have a column matrix okay you know that if you have a column matrix if you act a square matrix on it you get another column matrix right you get another column matrix so you'll call this as a this is some square matrix which i call as m and this is some other column matrix which is known as b all right so if you multiply a column matrix or a column vector as someone might call a column vector by an n by n square uh, n by n square matrix you will get another column matrix all right so this is an example for an operator this is an example for an operator okay in the case of complex functions you know that if you have a differential if you have if you differentiate this is an example for an operator in the case of complex functions this is an operator why if you take some function let's say x square and act upon it and act an operator on it okay so if you take a function a complex function or a real function if you take x square and do d by dx you will see that you get a different function of x which is 2x am i right if you take d by dx of x square you get 2x okay you see that x square is a different function from 2x Okay. So, this is an example for an operator because you take one vector, this is an example for a vector, you take one vector, act an operator on it, you get another vector. Or you, if you take one function, act an operator on it, you get another function. So, differential operators are examples for operators. Also, square matrices are examples for operators. Okay? You can say these are two different ways of representing an operator. Now, you might have already guessed that this is the reason why there were two uh, formulations of quantum mechanics. Right. One way to represent an operator is by matrix okay, and a vector by a column, column matrix. Right. Another way to represent a vector is by a complex function and then the oper operator would be differential operators. All right. So, if this representation is, to, is used, it is known as wave mechanics and if this representation is used exclusively, it is known as uh, Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. Right. Now, we know they are all part of the same theory. All right. So, we have found another object. We said that states are represented by uh, vectors. States are represented by vectors. And uh, we look how do we represent observables. We say that, all right, there are other objects here which uh, are called operators. Let's try representing observables by operators. All right. So, that's the next part that we have. Observables like energy, momentum, position, spin, etc. in quantum mechanics are represented by operators that act on state vectors. All right? Operators that act on state vectors. All right. Okay. All right. Now there is another problem. Okay, we can actually measure, you can actually measure the values of observables. You can measure the energy, you can measure the energy, you can measure the momentum. We can measure the position. These things can actually be measured. And what we get are not matrices. What we get are real numbers. Okay. What we get when you make an observation, when you make a measurement of an observable are real numbers. Am I right? You measure an energy, you get a number. You measure the momentum, you get a number. You me measure the position, you get the number. Okay. These are real numbers. Not any matrix or d by dx. We don't measure d by dx.
All right. So we have got energy, momentum, position, which are all measured as real numbers. You get a reading on an, uh, on some kind of apparatus. It's a real number, right? We never measure a matrix or a differential operator. Okay. So that's fine. So what do we do now? We need some real numbers. We need to associate some real numbers with these states, with these vectors, and these operators. Okay. We need to associate some real numbers. And then the only option, all right? There are not many options there. We already took, we already took vectors for states. We took operators for observables. Then now you need some real number associated with these things. And what you have is eigenvalues. So what you have is eigenvalues. So and this is known as an eigenvalue equation, right? So some operators when acts on a state, right? I, I said earlier that you get a different state when an operator acts on a state. You get a different operator. Uh, I'm sorry, you get a different vector when an operator acts on a st uh, another, sorry, when an operator acts on one vector, you get another vector generally, all right? But for an operator, if you take an operator, let's say A, a cap, there are some special states, all right? There are some special states which give you, when, when the operator acts, it gives you exactly the same state. It doesn't change the state multiplied by some number, okay? Multiplied by some number. This is also there. Okay, so there are some special states corresponding to an operator, right? And when the operator acts on the special state, it does not change the state. It gives you exactly the same state multiplied by a number, right? And in this case, we call this equation as an eigenvalue equation. Eigenvalue equation. Okay, which means that operator acting on the state gives you a number multiplied by the same uh, state, same vector. All right. So I I am already using state and vector interchangeably. The word state and vector interchangeably. All right. It is known as an eigenvalue equation, and in this terminology, uh, we say that alpha is an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue small a. All right. So alpha is the eigenvector of operator a corresponding to the eigenvalue small a. Right, that's the terminology. So we have got numbers here, but we have a small problem. These numbers, all right, these numbers, because we are talking about linear vector space and operators over there, these numbers are complex. These numbers are complex. Okay, they can be imaginary, there can be an imaginary part. But when you measure an energy or a momentum, it's never complex, it's always a real number. All right, this means that. This only means that we cannot take all operators as observables. We can take only those operators. Right, so we'll just identify, I'm sorry, we'll just identify, we'll try to make the identification that eigenvalues are the measured values. Okay, we'll try to make the identification that uh, measured values are actually eigenvalues. All right, but there's a problem eigenvalues can be real or complex. This means that we cannot take all operators as representing observables. It means that we can only take those operators, we can only take those operators whose eigenvalues are always real. Okay, so if you want to represent the measured values by eigenvalues, you should take only those operators whose eigenvalues are actually real. All right. So we can we, we conclude that all operators cannot represent observables, only those with real eigenvalues. All right. So we can choose only uh, those operators whose eigenvalues are real and such operators we know from if you if you look at the mathematics textbook you know that there are a class of operators called Hermitian operators whose eigenvalues are always real. Okay. All right, so this is what uh, this is what we mean. Hermitian operators, eigenvalues are real. So now we make this correspondence a bit more concrete. Earlier we said that uh, quantum mechanical states are vectors in Hilbert space. We'll put a double headed arrow. All right. So corresponding to every quantum mechanical state, you will have a vector in Hilbert space. Corresponding to every quantum mechanical observables, you have an operator, but not op not all kinds of operators, but specifically a Hermitian operator. Okay, so earlier I said that observables are represented by operators. I'll make it a bit more clear. I'll say that observables are represented by Hermitian operators. All right, and measured values corresponds to eigenvalues of Hermitian operator. All right, so we just try this side. We just make this identification, and we see. We make. Uh, we try. All right, we. Uh, we 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 make predictions using this kind of mathematical formalism, and we check. Right, we check we can we check it with experimental results and we see that 
it is good it works okay and ultimately this is the reason why this mathematical framework is used no other reason all right it's just that it works all right so this correspondence works because it makes uh, predictions correct predictions so this i call the correspondence between nature and mathematics on one side you have got nature on one side you have got nature there are quantum mechanical states etc and on the other side you have got uh, what do you say uh, mathematics so you see that there is a nice correspondence between nature and mathematics and as i said earlier it works okay and uh, it works to that extent that uh, people said that people used to say that or people say that mathematics is unreasonably effective all right it was eugene wigner who said that mathematics is unreasonably effective we don't know why mathematics is so effective but it all works unreasonably uh, effective okay so we have described quantum mechanical state we know how eigenvalues are there quantum mechanical observables are hermitian operator one thing that we missed out is probability okay one thing that we missed out is probability we also need to predict the probabilities of measurement right and that also can be identified using this thing that we'll be doing in the next session okay all right uh, so i think it's time to wind up for today the it's really interesting it's uh, there's a lot more to discuss in this but uh, our time is up and i thank you all for attending the class